Sutra Ananda S U N I. Now look at the palace where the four heavenly kings reside, and inspect all that moves in the water, on dry land, and in the air. Some are dark and some are bright, varying in shape and appearance. Yet all are nothing but dust before us. Distinctions and obstructions. Commentary: The Buddha said further to Ananda, Ananda, as you and I, at present, let's just talk about you and me. Now, look at the palace where the four heavenly kings reside. The heaven of the four kings is the heaven closest to us, located halfway up Mount Sumeru, as explained in the Buddhist sutras. It does not reach the peak of Mount Sumeru. The four great heavenly kings. Are the eastern heavenly king, the southern heavenly king, the western heavenly king, and the northern heavenly king. The lifespan of beings in the heaven of the four kings is five hundred years. After five hundred years, they are destined to fall, and the five months of decay appear, as I explained earlier. A day and a night in the heaven of the four kings. Is equivalent to fifty years among people. How is this? You ask. I'll give you an example to help you understand. If we feel very happy on a given day, the day passes without our even being aware aware of it. We feel the day was very short. All of us are like that because it is blissful in the heavens. A day and a night, there is equal to fifty years among people. Why is fifty years such a long time in the realm of people? In the realm of people, there is continual disturbance and affliction, suffering and difficulty, fighting and quarreling. People are busy from morning to night, and they don't have any idea what they are doing. They are like flies in the air, flying north, south, east, and west, without knowing what they are doing. You haven't any bliss here. So the time is very long. Then again, a day and a night among people is equivalent to fifty years in the house, because the pain and suffering in the house is so intense, and so the beings there feel the time is extended. From this, you should understand that time is neither short nor long. Earlier, a disciple asked me, "What is time? I haven't any time. There is no time." Time is just each person's individual awareness of long or short. That is all. If you are happy every day, fifty years can go by, and you won't feel it has been a long time. If one's life is very blissful, if one has no worries, anxieties, anger, or afflictions, one's entire life seems but a short time, the blink of an eye. Ultimately, time is nothing more than a distinction based upon each person's awareness. When I said I haven't any time, it can mean that I don't perceive time, that I'm so busy that I don't perceive time, and that I'm not intent upon perceiving it. These three meanings. And inspect all that moves in the water, on dry land, and in the air. That is, look at all the creatures. All the animate objects, without exception, some are dark and some are bright, varying in shape and appearance. Yet all are nothing but dust before us. Distinctions and obstructions. They are all dust before our eyes, just obstructions arising from our making distinction from your making distinctions. They are not your own things. They are an external realm of dust, the dust outside. This dust is an obstruction. It lingers in your brain and in your thoughts, but it does not belong to you. So try among them. You should distinguish which is self and which is other. I ask you now to select from within your seeing which is the substance of the self and which is the appearance of things. Commentary: Because Ananda has still not understood the doctrine of the true mind. He could not make a distinction between the true mind and the false mind. Shakyamuni Buddha has just told him of these various shapes and appearances, all are nothing but the dust before you. They are all a mundane state before you. It is distinctions and obstructions. 
Among them, you should distinguish between self and between other. Ananda, at this point, you should make a distinction between that which is your own self nature and that which is the substance of things. Self refers to one's own true mind. Other refers to the substance of things. I ask you now to select from within your thing, which is the substance of the self, and which is the appearance of things. The substance of self refers to the substance of the same nature. Can you tell it from the appearance, the characteristic of things? Take a look yourself and see if you can make the distinction. If you can, you are more intelligent than Ananda. If you can't, you aren't as smart as Ananda. Everyone can test his or her own wisdom. Sutra, Ananda, if you take a good look at everything, everywhere within the range of your vision, extending from the palaces of the sun and moon to the seven gold mountain ranges, all that you see is not you, but are things of different features and lights. At closer range, you will gradually see clouds floating, birds flying, wind blowing, dust rising, trees, plants, rivers, mountains, grasses, animals, people, all of which are not you, but things. Commentary This doctrine is unspeakably wonderful. You put it into words, and it's not it. You describe it, and that isn't what it is. What's it like? It is ineffable. You can, how can you ask what it is like? Ananda, if you take a good look at everything, everywhere within the range of your vision, is a man it to the ultimate point, to the very source of your seeing, extending from the palaces of the sun and moon, so volume 2, the same nature, the seven gold mountain ranges. The seven golden mountains surround Mount Sumeru. Around the four sides of Mount Sumeru are seven ranges of mountains made of gold, each separated by a sea of fragrant water. Where are these mountains? You say, I'll go there and sell some gold and get rich. I can't tell, tell you that. If I tell you, and you go steal the gold, and the gold on the golden mountains gets depleted. How can they remain golden? Sumeru is a Sanskrit word, word which is interpreted to mean wonderfully high. Surrounding the four sides of Mount Sumeru are seven layers of golden mountains. Now I'll tell you something. Even if you haven't taken the five precepts, you are still not permitted to steal my gold mountains. Those gold mountains are mine. If you steal my gold mountains, I'll recite a mantra and make your head ache so much that you won't be able to pick up the gold. Don't try to bully this teacher. He has too much power. Look carefully everywhere. Use your heavenly eye to look. Use your Buddha eye to look. Use your wisdom eye to look. All that you see is not you, but are things of different features and lights. Of all these appearances of things, tell me which one is you, find one. At closer range, you will gradually see clouds floating, flying back and forth through the sky. Birds flying overhead, wind blowing, but there is no way to explain this. I don't have any method to explain these words of the Sutra. I just have to stop and ask the Great Master, the Sixth Patriarch. The text here says quite clearly that the wind moves. But the Sixth Patriarch Sutra says, It is not the wind which moves, it is not the flag which moves. Ultimately, what is it that moves? The Sixth Patriarch Sutra says, It is your mind's characters which move. Here, though, it isn't known whose mind moves. Is it your mind that moves, or is it my mind that moves? Is it someone else's mind that moves? Whose mind is it that moves? So how am I supposed to explain these words of the Sutra? There's no way to explain them. One doesn't know what moves. The Sikh Vajra Sutra says it isn't the wind that moves. The Sutra here says the wind moves. Which would you say is right? 
If you say it is the mind that moves, not the wind, then whose mind moves? I don't know, you say. If you don't know, then it isn't your mind which moves. If your mind hasn't moved, whose has? Well, I just explained according to the meaning of the sutra text here in its most literal aspect. We just say that the wind moves. Your mind hasn't moved. My mind hasn't moved. Someone else's mind hasn't moved. The wind moves and blows up black, black smoke and pestilent vapors. The movement of the wind is a display of temper. The heavenly Lord gets angry and blows up a great wind which uproots trees and blows down houses. Dust rising. How can dust rise? It can rise by itself. No, the reason the dust rises is that the wind blows. At first, the dust is sleeping quite nicely on the ground. That dust is quite comfortable. But the wind comes and says, Wake up, wake up, and go away. Then the dust gets up and goes to work. What does what work does dust do? You wonder. It attaches itself to everything in the world, and it makes everything dirty. This is the work dust does. Dust works to make every place unclean. Do you understand? Trees, lands, rivers, mountains, grasses, animals, people. There are still other things, vegetation and every kind of inanimate object, as well as people and animals, all of which are not you but things. In the last analysis, are these uh, the appearance of things or are they your signature? Answer, speak up. This passage has a tone of inquiry. I'm asking you, so hurry up and speak. Why aren't you speaking? That's how it is expressed here. Is it true that things are not you or isn't it? This is what is meant by tapping someone with a stick and making him yell, arousing someone from his folly. He is brought up for questioning just as if it were before a judge during an inquisition. Are you guilty of stealing? If so, hurry up and admit it. If not, then explain yourself. Sutra Ananda, all things near and far have the nature of things of each is distinctly different. They are seen with the same pure essence of seeing. Thus, all the categories of things have their individual distinctions, but the same nature has no differences. This essential wonderful brightness is most certainly your seeing nature. Commentary Through the various presentations of the doctrine, Shakyamuni Buddha has asked Ananda, You see, all these things which is your seeing essence, find it. Now he makes the distinction between the essence of seeing and the appearance of things because Ananda is afraid he won't be able to tell them apart. Ananda said that things and seeing are mixed together and he doesn't know which is which. So the Buddha has initiated this discussion in order to reveal the seeing nature and this is a section of text posture to it. Ananda, all things near and far, have the nature of things, all have the appearance of things, the substance and nature of things, although each is distinctly different. They are all different. Wind is wind, dust is dust, birds are birds, clouds are clouds, trees are trees, mountain streams are mountain streams, grasses are grasses, people and animals are people and animals. In Chinese, the character cha should be pronounced chu. This is an important part of scholarship. Most people who go to school for a few days or a few years don't know this. To be aware of this kind of distinction in the meaning of characters takes 15 years of study at the very least. How many years have you studied? Someone asks. I'll tell you frankly, I went to school two and a half years studied less than you people have. Then why do you understand? I don't know why I understand. It is enough that when it comes right down to it. I do understand. You shouldn't ask why. Isn't that right? They are seen with the same pure essence of seeing. 
your sense of seeing is able to see all these diff uh, differing things clearly. Uh, so all the categories of things have their individual distinctions, but the seeing nature has no differences. The things your seeing encounters are all naturally different from one another, but what distinctions lie within the seeing nature itself? When you see Mr. Chang, it is the seeing nature. When you see Mr. Lee, it is still the seeing nature. The seeing is the same without any distinction. A cat, a person, no matter what you see, it is seeing. Does the seeing change? Does it make distinctions? Shakyuni Buddha asks Ananda, Do you see any distinctions in the seeing? Ananda hasn't anything to say. It's not that he's dumb. He's just tongue-tied. If he were dumb, he could still make a guttural sounds, but Ananda can't even do that at this point. What is the most essential, most wonderful, most brilliant thing? The Buddha asked him, What is it? Speak up. Ananda still didn't make a sound. If you think about it, you realize that the Buddha certainly asked Ananda again and again at this point, What do you say this is? But Ananda still doesn't have anything to say. The Buddha is one of the great kindness and great compassion. And so when he saw he had confounded his disciples to the point he didn't have anything to say, he said, I'll tell you, this is essential, this essential wonderful brightness is most certainly your seeing nature. Do you know it? Do you understand? That's the tone he used. Sutra, if seeing were a thing, then you should also be able to see my seeing. Commentary, this session of text is expressed wonderfully well. If seeing were a thing, then you should able to be you should also be able to see my seeing. Ananda, you've said that seeing and the substance of things are mixed together, that they cannot be distinguished clearly. You said the same nature is the thing. If it were, you should be able to see what my sin is like, and I should be able to see what your sin is like. Can you? I don't mean that you see what I see, but can you see the thing that I see with? What is it like? Is it white? Is it black? Is it yellow? Is it yet? What color it is? At that point, Ananda was probably tongue-tied once again. Is it long? Is it short? Is it square? Is it round? Things definitely have a form and an appearance and if seeing is indistinguishable from things as you say, then what is seeing a form and appearance? Take a look. Mountains have a form of mountains. Trees have a form of trees. Rivers have a form of rivers. Ultimately, what is your seeing like? Have you seen it? The Buddha asks Ananda. Sutra, if you say you see my seeing, when we both look at the same thing, then when I'm not seeing, why don't you see my not seeing? Commentary, this sutra is truly difficult to explain. As it goes back and forth to bring out the principles, you get can get confused just trying to read it, not to mention trying to explain it. What does that say, you ask? What's that all about? I tell you, if you say you see my seeing, when we both look at the same thing, and when I'm not seeing, why do you see my not seeing? When you see something and I don't see it, how is it that you can't see my not seeing it? You should also be able to know that I do not see it, but you don't know. You can't see whether or not my seeing sees it. This is how this principle goes. You say that seeing is a thing, and when you and I look at the same thing, you say that you see my seeing. Therefore, when I do not see it, you should be able to see my not seeing it. But you can't see my not seeing it. Therefore, you can't have seen my seeing either. This is an analogy. Doesn't it seem that this is difficult to place to make clear? But if you understand this principle, then the passage is very easy to understand. 
If you don't understand the principle, then you can explain it many different ways and all you will do is confuse people. You explain and they say, in the end, what does this say? That's what's it all about. It talks about so many things. Seeing what seeing. I really like the Suragama Sutra because the discussions in it are so wonderful. More wonderful than that wonderfully high mountain. Sutra, if you do see my not seeing, it is clearly not a thing that I am not seeing. If you do not see my not seeing, then it is clearly not a thing. And how can you say it is not you? Commentary, this session of taste is very to explain. If you understand the previous passage, you should be able to understand this passage upon hearing it read. No need to explain it. Everyone has understood it, so I just go on strike. However, there's someone who says, I haven't understood yet. Please explain it. So I will. I won't go on strike for the time being. If you do see my not seeing, it is clearly not a thing that I am not seeing. I say that the thing is not a thing, but you don't believe it yet. Let me make it clearer. If my seeing nature, which is without distinctions, sees a thing which has certain distinctions, and if the thing becomes that thing, as you say, then the seeing nature should be visible. Therefore, you should be able to see my seeing, because if seeing is a thing, it should have characteristics which can be dis distinguished. However, there is nothing certain about when my eyes look at things. Sometimes my glance comes in contact with something, and then you say the thing is that thing. But sometimes I withdraw my glance from the object and do not see it. If you hold that when I am looking at something, my thing is a thing, and if you say that when you also look at a, that thing, you see my thing as well, then when I withdraw my glance, and no longer look at the thing. Why can't you also see the substance of my not seeing? You can't. Why can't you point to where it is? Since you cannot see my not seeing, then are you really seeing my thing when we are both looking at something? However, say that you insist that you do see where my not seeing is when I'm not seeing something. The substance of my not seeing is still the same nature. The appearance which I do not see is still, is still a thing. When my seeing has separated from the thing and you continue to see the substance of my seeing, as you say, it should be clear without further explanation that my not seeing is clearly not a thing not seen. If you do not see my not seeing, then it is clearly not a thing. If you do not see where my not seeing is, if you don't see the appearance of my not seeing, then the thing is not a thing. You had doubts and you said that seeing and the substance of things are mixed together and cannot be distinguished clearly. But how do you understand? You can't see where my not seeing is. You don't know whether or not I see. Why? Because my seeing hasn't any form or appearance. It is neither green, yellow, red, white, nor black, neither long, short, square, or not round. It isn't anything, and so you can't see it. If you can't see it, it is obviously then not a thing. Why Chinese people scold someone? They say, you're nothing, but it is actually a good thing not to be anything. Your seeing nature is not a thing, so when people scold someone by saying you're nothing, a very subtle and wonderful meaning is actually to be found in it. Most people just consider it an insult and don't understand the meaning. Why not? They don't understand the Suragama Sutra. They did. If they did, they would know that what is not a thing is actually our seeing nature. If you do not see my not seeing, then it is clearly not a thing. This passage is like a, on the earlier one. Everything that can be returned is clearly not you. 
Whatever can be given back to others is not yours, but what there is of you that cannot be returned, whose is it if it is not yours? The same doctrine is being expressed in the present passage. The things that you can see clearly are things why that which you cannot see clearly is not a thing. You cannot put the thing which you cannot see in the same category with things. Your seeing and things won't stick together. You say, if thing cannot be put in the same category as things, what is it then? What is it in the same category with? You figure it out, investigate it. People who investigate Chen, Diana, investigate a portal, a meditation topic, and this is a portal you can investigate. You see that it is not a thing. What would you say it is? Asking who is mindful of the Buddha is simply to investigate this question. If you can recognize a thing just at this place, if you can say, oh, basically the thing does not come and does not, does not go. Basically, it is not produced and not extinguished. Basically, it penetrates perfectly without obstruction. If you understand this doctrine, then you understand your seeing nature. In the early passage, the Buddha asks, Who is it if it is not yours? Here he asks Ananda, How can you say it is not for you? How can you say it is not yours? How can you say it gets mixed up with things? How can you say there is no clear distinction? Do you understand now? You should understand by now. I have spoken so many principles for you that if you are still unclear, you truly are a muddled worm. Sutra, what is more? If your thing is a thing, things should also see you when you see things. With the substance and nature mixed up together, you and I and everyone in the world are no longer in order. Commentary Shakyuni Buddha said, Since you can't see my seeing, since the seeing hasn't any distinctive appearance that can be seen, ultimately is there any seeing. The seeing still exists, but although it exists, it has no visible appearance, no substance, and there is nowhere it can return to. So tell me, how can you fail to acknowledge it as yours? But if you still insist, if you are still attached, you should know that what is more. If your seeing is a thing, things should also be you when you see things. If you insist upon saying that your seeing is definitely a thing, then things ought to be able to see your seeing too. After all, you say your seeing is simply a thing, a thing which you can see things in that case. Other things must also be able to close, and those things should see your see, so seeing. Those things should see your seeing. With the substance and nature mixed up together, you look at things and things look at you. Ultimately, who is looking at whom? Speak up. Which looks at which? Perhaps Ananda might say, I just like two people. You see me and I see you. But when people look at one another, there is mutual awareness. When they look at you, you'll be aware of it. And when you look at me, I am aware of it. But when things look at you, other things are aware of it. When your seeing, which you say is a thing, looks at other things, uh, the other things are aware of it. This would be the mixing up together of substance and nature. They are in a state of confusion. Things that can see you and you can see things and things that can see one another. This is to make a mess of things. It's plumbing everything into one category. Then you and I and everyone in the world are no longer in order. Everyone in the world refers to the sentient world, that is, pupil and material world, that is, mountains, rivers, the great earth, the houses, porches, verandas, and cottages. All sentient beings, including pupil, are also called the popular retribution. 
the mountains and rivers, the great earth. The, the houses, porches, verandas, and cottages are called the dependent retribution. Proper retribution is so called because the body that living beings have is the proper retribution for them to be undergoing at any given time. In short, if nothing worthy, nothing would be capable, capable and everything should would be the state of disorder. This would not be a world. Everything in the world would not add up to a world. That is the meaning here.